Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we introduced the alternating series test. This was a really nice, really simple test that can be used when the terms of your series alternate between positive and negative. So suppose that we want to add up the terms of this alternating series, b1 minus b2 plus b3 minus b4, and so on. Here, these bk terms are just some positive numbers. If, in addition, they are decreasing and tend to zero, then the alternating series test says that this series will converge. The intuition behind this test was given by the following picture. Suppose that you start at zero and add your first term b1. That moves you over here to the right to get your first partial sum. When you then subtract b2, you move back to the left, but you're not gonna go all the way back to start because your terms are decreasing. When you add b3, you're gonna move back to the right, but again, you don't move as far to the right as you did before. You keep doing this, subtract b4, add b5, and your partial sums are sort of ping-ponging back and forth. Since our terms are going to zero, however, these changes that you see are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, they'll be as small as you like, which tells me that my partial sums must be approaching some finite number s. That s is going to be the sum of our series. Now, the reason I'm going over this once again is because there's actually a bit more information hidden in this picture. Specifically, there's a bound on the error that we get by using one of our partial sums to approximate the true sum. To see what I mean, suppose that we have a series that satisfies these assumptions. So the terms bk are positive, decreasing, and tend to zero. Suppose as well that we want to estimate the true value of this sum using our third partial sum, s3. How close is this approximation? Well, we know that the true sum has to lie somewhere between s3 and s4, which means the biggest the error could possibly be is this quantity, b4. Maybe instead we want to approximate using the fourth partial sum. How big is the error now? Well, the sum has to lie somewhere between s4 and s5. So the biggest error that we could possibly have is this term, b5. In general, if you want to approximate using the nth partial sum, the biggest possible error would be bn plus 1, the next term that you've neglected to include in your approximation. This result is what we refer to as the alternating series estimation theorem, and a precise statement is given on the next slide. All right, here it is, folks, the alternating series estimation theorem, which I'll abbreviate as ASET. Suppose that you have some alternating series, b0 minus b1 plus b2 minus b3, where the bk's are positive quantities that decrease and tend to zero. In that case, the alternating series test says that our series converges, and maybe s will denote the sum. The estimation theorem is based on our reasoning from the last slide, and gives us an upper bound on the error that we get by approximating the true sum with the nth partial sum. It says that the magnitude of the error is no more than bn plus 1, the first term in our positive sequence that's not included when we make this approximation. Let's see how the estimation theorem can be used in an example. Here's a quick example showing how the alternating series estimation theorem can be used. We're looking for a bound on the magnitude of the error when we approximate this sum s using its nth partial sum. Note that s here is the sum of the alternating harmonic series, a series we showed was convergent in the last lesson. So we want to know, how accurate is our approximation of s if we add just the first n terms of this series? Additionally, we'd like to determine whether sn is an overestimation or an underestimation of the true sum. Okay, to use the alternating series estimation theorem, we first need to identify our positive terms bk. In this case, I think bk is 1 over k. We should also make sure that the assumptions of the ASET are satisfied, but note that indeed they are. The terms bk form a decreasing sequence that tends to zero. For part A, we want to estimate the error when approximating s using the sum of the first 10 terms. Well, according to the ASET, the error will be less than bn plus 1, the absolute value of the first term that's not included in our sum. So here, the absolute value of s minus s10, the magnitude of our error, will be less than b11, which is 1 over 11. To help us to decide whether this is an overestimation or an underestimation, I've included the diagram from our first slide. 
The terms in our series follow the same sign pattern as in this diagram. Positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. Therefore, when we add our last term, minus 1 over 10 to the partial sum, we'll end up on the left side of the true value of s. Therefore, s10 is going to be an underestimation. Okay, now moving on to part b. We're approximating s using the sum of the first 99 terms of the series. According to the ASET, the error in this approximation is at most b100, which is 1 over 100. So what this is telling us is that we need to add up 99 terms of our series to ensure that our approximation is accurate to just two decimal places. This series converges very slowly. Finally, is S99 an overestimation or an underestimation to S? Well, when we add in our final term, 1 over 99, a positive quantity, we're going to end up on the right side of the true value of S. So S99 is going to be an overestimation, since the final term is positive. I'd like to end this video with a more substantial example involving the estimation theorem. We're first going to show that this series, the sum from k equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to the k over the square root of k factorial, converges. Then we're going to approximate its sum correct to at least two decimal places. That is, we're going to approximate the sum with an error that's less than 10 to the minus 2. So our first job is to show that this series converges. And as you may have guessed from the minus 1 to the k in the numerator, this series is alternating. Sure enough, our series is given by 1 over the square root of 0 factorial minus 1 over the square root of 1 factorial plus 1 over the square root of 2 factorial minus 1 over the square root of 3 factorial and so on. It's alternating. So a natural choice for us is the alternating series test. The absolute values of our terms are given by bk equals 1 over the square root of k factorial and we need to make sure that these bk's are decreasing and tend to zero. Sure enough, they are. Of course, when k gets bigger, the square root of k factorial is going to get bigger as well, and so 1 over this term is getting smaller. So these terms are decreasing. And as k goes off to infinity, our denominator blows up to infinity as well, so these terms are going to zero. According to the alternating series test, this series is convergent. Okay, now that we know the series converges, we can go about approximating the total sum, which maybe we'll call s. We're going to use a partial sum to try to get within two decimal places of s. But how do we know which partial sum to use to achieve this level of accuracy? Hmm, maybe we can use our alternating series estimation theorem. Notice that when we applied the alternating series test, we already confirmed that the terms bk are decreasing and tend to zero. These are exactly the conditions you have to check when using the estimation theorem, so there's no further assumptions left to verify. According to the estimation theorem, the magnitude of the error in approximating s using the nth partial sum sn is at most bn plus 1, which for us is 1 over the square root of n plus 1 factorial. We need this error term to be less than 10 to the minus 2. Now, if this expression had no factorial in it, we might be able to move things around and actually solve for n. But it turns out that solving equations or inequalities involving factorials can actually be pretty tough. So I think our best option is to just plug in some small values for n until this inequality is satisfied. If you try a few values, you should find that n equals 7 is the magic number. When n is 7, 1 over the square root of n plus 1 factorial is 1 over the square root of 8 factorial. If you punch this into your calculator, you should find that it's a little bit less than 0 0.005. So it's certainly less than 10 to the minus 2. Okay, we have a game plan. We're going to estimate the total sum s using the partial sum s7 we find that s7 is 1 over the square root of 0 factorial minus 1 over the square root of 1 factorial and so on all the way up to minus 1 over the square root of 7 factorial. If you pass this off to your calculator, you should get a value approximately equal to 0 0.43488. Okay, now here's the big question. 
is our approximation actually correct in the first two decimal places? Well, let's think about this. We have an alternating series, plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. We ended our partial sum with a negative term, which means we're slightly underestimating the true value of the sum. But I wonder, by how much are we underestimating it? According to this error bound, the sum is no more than 0 0.005 larger than this number. But even if we had that maximum possible error, 0 0.005, that's still not enough to push us into the next second decimal place. It's gonna get us close, but we will still have 0 0.43 at the start. So yeah, this approximation is correct to at least two decimal places.